Good afternoon. My name is Allison. I'm Director of Education at the National First Ladies Library, located at the National First Ladies Historic Site here in Canton, Ohio. And I'm so excited to have you here today for our children's program called Fun with Flotus. Um, we've done this one a few times, but we add new things to it every year. Um, we're celebrating Independence Day, and we're doing that through looking at the First Ladies and other women who have um, helped to make history that maybe have been overlooked in our history books. So I'm so excited for you to join us today, whether you're watching with me live in Zoom or on Facebook, or if you're watching a video after the fact. Um, we are in webinar, so you can see me, but I can't see you. And hopefully, thumbs up, you can see um, my PowerPoint screen. I've got Nancy Reagan um, on the screen here celebrating the 4th of July. We're celebrating uh, Nancy Reagan here at the National First Ladies Historic Site with an exhibition about her. The exhibition is now on view and it celebrates her 100th birthday. She isn't alive, but this past year would have been her 100th birthday. And I wanted to start today about talking about some of the ways that First Ladies and First Families celebrate this special holiday. Um, first thing I want to tell you is, again, I mentioned you can see me, I can't see you, but you can communicate with me a few different ways. So there's a chat. And again, um, we're online, so we want to use good online manners and be careful, so we don't want to share anything too specific about ourselves, but if I ask you a question or if you have a question for me, you can type in the chat. Um, I've also got a poll going, and I'm going to start a few different polls as a way that we can interact together throughout the program. Does that sound good? Okay, so... We talk a lot at um, National First Ladies Library about the different ways that first families celebrate holidays. And um, first ladies have big celebrations for uh, Christmas and other December holidays. They start planning as soon as the new year begins. So sometimes as soon as they become first lady and walk in the White House to live there, they have to start celebrating or planning a Christmas um, and Hanukkah and Kwanzaa celebration for the White House. So um, it's a pretty huge undertaking. And Easter is a big undertaking at the White House too. There are big Easter celebrations, but Independence Day is a little bit different. So during the 19th century, presidents and first ladies often had receptions at the White House. And over time, the receptions and parties and activities that happen in Washington, D.C. on the 4th of July, um, they've changed a little bit, but they're pretty low key. Um, and sometimes they don't involve the first families. A lot of times the first families are taking a break, just like you are during the 4th of July holiday. So there might be um, some fireworks. There might be uh, an orchestra celebration on the National Mall. Um, but the first lady isn't always present for that. So I'm going to show you some ways that um, first ladies celebrate. And I'm going to launch a poll. Um, how do you celebrate? Ooh, my poll didn't update. So how do you celebrate Independence Day? Um, my poll is up on the screen and you can answer however you want. Maybe parade, cookout or picnic, fireworks, swimming, road trip, or baseball game. Um, and you can also put in the chat if there's something I didn't mention. One of the things I had added, because they have a little something to read to you by a first lady, is that some um, people like to learn about history, American history, and kind of reflect on it. So if there is another way that you celebrate, uh, let us know. Someone said they like Nancy's shoes a lot. Nancy was really good at picking out great outfits. Um, for Christmas, she had really cool shoes that she would always hot glue red poof balls to. So she's really coordinated a great outfit. So if you have something special you wear uh, for July 4th, tell us too. So I'm gonna give you one more second, and then I'm going to, oop, as you're doing that, I'm gonna tell you about a few other activities that we have 
for you at the National First Ladies Library. So um, we're still doing a lot of virtual programs and activities. And if you go to our Eventbrite page, you can actually register to um, purchase a kit. Um, so we have three different kits that are going to be available this summer. The first one um, is just getting packed up to mail out now. It's called Ice Ice Dolly, and it's inspired by Dolly Madison's Strawberry Ice Cream. Um, we've also got one inspired by Rosalind Carter and her Pollinator Garden. And the third one is Lou Hoover and Geology, called Lou Geology Rocks. So we're super excited about those and those um, are shipping out soon. We also have a special guide for today's activity. Um, and I will post that before the program um, is over today. Um, so I'm going to share, I'm going to end my poll here and then share the results. So here's the results. So a lot of people like to cook out or have a picnic, lots of people go to fireworks and some people go swimming. Um, and that's our poll. And I am going to, yeah, some people get scared of fireworks. I totally get that Cynthia, Cynthia said her dog is afraid of fireworks. And you'll never believe there's actually one first lady who historically was pretty um, upset by loud fireworks. And I will tell you who that was in a moment. Um, so ways that first ladies celebrate the 4th of July holiday. Here we have Michelle Obama celebrating with fireworks. Fireworks are a really popular way, obviously. And Washington, D.C. is probably a great place to experience fireworks, right? So um, here we have the Fords. Betty Ford was first lady during um, the bicentennial. So there were huge celebrations um, of the US's birthday. And you can see her in a super cool patriotic outfit, um, looking on at the fireworks from the White House. Parades are another way presidents have, and first ladies celebrate um, the fourth. So here are the Carters. There's Rosalind on the right, President Carter on the far left, and Amy, their daughter, in the middle on a in a parade. So if you um, celebrate uh, by watching a parade, um, we have some adults who say, yeah, I was at the bicentennial year and it was awesome. So um, I'm sorry that we missed out on that. Um, but you can see uh, here they are in a parade. Maybe you've watched a parade. Um, I love to collect candy with my kids during parades. Um, or maybe you've marched with Girl Scouts or um, Boy Scouts um, in a parade. So there are lots of ways to engage. Um, a lot of presidents and first ladies are on the campaign trail, right? So um, Hillary Clinton is a past first lady and she's also run for president and she's run for a Senate seat. So she's spent um, many uh, July 4th holidays on the campaign trail. And that was one way that um, first families and first ladies celebrate uh, the 4th of July. There's lots of opportunities to get up and speak in front of groups of people and attend pancake breakfasts and activities related to the holiday. And what better way to um, celebrate this country by talking about your right to vote and your power to choose and elect someone for office, right? And baseball is pretty much the official sport of July 4th. And here is First Lady Barbara Bush at a Rangers game uh, throwing out the first pitch. So she was very passionate about reading, but obviously her son, um, was very passionate about baseball, and um, she probably attended many Rangers games with her family. So it looks like Sammy in the chat is a big fan of the Rangers. So if you have a baseball team that you like to go see, you can tell me in the chat too. Or if you have a first lady or a historical figure that you would like to see throw out the first pitch at a baseball game, um, let me know too. And of course, uh, 
bands are an important part of our celebration. So um, of course the president's own Marine band um, are often a part of celebrations attended by uh, first ladies and presidents and first families. And I believe you can see uh, the Trump family up here um, looking on as the Marine band plays. So those are some of the ways that we celebrate. And before we get to the story I wanna share with you, um, oh, someone said they'd like to see a historical figure, um, Martha Washington throw out the first pitch. One of the things I wanted to mention, I said that there was one first lady who I know for a fact got um, really upset with the fireworks and that was Eleanor Roosevelt. And I didn't update my poll to say one of the ways we can celebrate uh, the 4th of July and Independence Day is to reflect on history um, and our rights and think about history and learn about history. But obviously Eleanor Roosevelt that was really important to her. And she kept a column throughout her time as first lady and beyond called My Day that she published in the paper. And I wanted to read one to you. Um, this is from July 4th, 1940. And she's reflecting on the 4th of July. She says, tomorrow is the 4th of July. And this year, it seems to me that this particular date should have a very deep meaning for us all. Our forefathers wrote the Declaration of Independence, and on that declaration, our Constitution was based. We fought as a young nation for the ideas that were expressed by the men who wrote this document. Though sometimes it seems as though during, an, during the intervening years, we had forgotten all the document applies, the events of the last few months have made many of us think over carefully what are the things which really matter to us as individuals in the United States of America. We will have to be very sure what we want for ourselves and our fellow citizens in order really to organize our strength and live or die for the things in which we believe. I personally want to continue to live in a country where I can think as I please, go to any church I please, or to none if that is my desire. Say what I please, and within the limits of any free society, do what I please. Long ago, we decided here that if we held views opposing those of other people, it was against the interests of our country to try to persuade those others by force to agree with us. We could go on talking about our ideas in the hope of eventually winning a majority. And it seems to me that this is the essence of democracy. I am willing to be asked to sacrifice time and money for the good of the country as a whole. I am willing to be asked to share what I am able to earn with other less fortunate people, and I am willing to consider any curtailment of personal liberty, which I can be persuaded, is for the good of the majority, but I want to be able to discuss it. I want the right to work, and I want the opportunity to be extended to, to all my fellow citizens. I want them to have an equal opportunity for educational development, for health and recreation, which is all part of the building of a human being capable of coping with the modern world. This is a lot of words, but I think it's really cool. So I wanna finish it up. It's only two more paragraphs. I want to have within my own hands, the choice of my leaders. And if the majority opinion is against me at any time, I want the right to differ while recognizing the necessity of cooperation on my part in order to prove fairly whether the majority opinion is right or not. On this 4th of July morning, I hope each and every one of us will dedicate ourselves to the service of our country and the service of our fellow citizens never forgetting that we hope through our example to strengthen the ultimate brotherhood of man throughout the world. So I really love that 
I thought it was really interesting and it was very cool to read um, the reflections of a first lady during the year 1940 and think of history and everything that's happened um, and how we can still reflect on those words. So Anna says July 4th is also my mom's birthday and she is a firecracker. I love that. So what we're going to do today, we're going to read a story. And then we're going to do an activity. Um, and I am going to post at the end um, our little guide because it has some additional activities that we can't do together today. They're kind of um, science experiments in inspired by Independence Day. Um, and there's one connected to the book that we're going to read today. So besides promoting the first ladies, one of the things the National First Ladies Library likes to do is promote women in history. So obviously there are some really cool first ladies that made waves during the Revolutionary War, but there are also some overlooked women in history. So today we are going to read a book about one of them, and then we are going to do a little around the house scavenger hunt about a few others. So I am really thrilled to share a brand new book with you called Revolu Revolutionary Prudence Right, Leading the Minute Women in the Fight for Independence. It's by Beth Anderson and it's illustrated by Susan Reagan. It has really beautiful illustrations. These are the times that try men's and women's souls, Thomas Paine. Prudence Cummings painted, snipped, and folded her precious piece of paper, crafting a love box like any colonial girl. So a love box is kind of an origami kind of valentine that was popular during colonial times. But when she bested boys at school, hunted and fished with her father, and debated her brothers on the rule of the British king, it was clear Prudence had a spark of independence. Year after year, Prudence fumed as King George III of England tightened his grip on the American colonies. He robbed them of hard earned money with taxes on tea, sugar, glass, paper, lead, and paint. He denied their rights to make their own laws and sell their own goods. He invaded their homes with British soldiers who demanded free room and board. Tensions mounted as suspicion crept among the colonists. Who was a Tory loyal to the king? Who was a patriot determined to fight for their rights? In January 1773, Prudence and her husband David packed into the meeting house with the citizens of Pepperell. A new pamphlet had arrived from Patriot leaders in Boston. The restless crowd quieted, anxious to hear every word. Rights of the colonists, violations by the king. Were the towns willing to join the fight? Male voices rose in a chorus, eyes. It was a unanimous, with signatures inked on paper, Pepperell, Massachusetts officially joined the network of resistance, a network that stretched from Boston to meeting houses across the colony and into homes. Prudence and other women sewed scraps of cloth into quilts. When talk turned into possibility of war, her stitches lurched out of line. Ripping them back, straightening them out, she studied the quilt. Small pieces, repeating patterns. She scanned the circle of women. Small actions, too, might form a pattern, a pattern of rebellion. Inspired by the patriots of Boston, who protested the king's tax on tea, the women brewed a plan of their own. They marched from their homes, dumped their tea on the town common, and set it aflame. No British tea. Prudence grew herbs and made her own liberty tea. No British cloth. She spun flax into linen and wove homespun fabric. No British sugar. She boiled maple sap into syrup. 
No gloves or garments, no ribbons or buttons, no glass or paper, she would do without. Prudence could live with inconvenience and additional work, but she couldn't live with unjust laws and stolen rights. The pattern of rebellion grew. So here she is packing up her things. The king struck back. He outlawed town meetings, closed the ports in Boston, and sent ships with more troops. The patriots prepared for war. They formed their own government, organized alarm riders to warn British troop movements and armed town militias, minute men ready to fight at a moment's notice. While David trained on the common with men, Prudence molded bullets at home, hoping they'd never be used. Prudence and David cheered as Pepperell raised a liberty flag in defiance of the king, but not everyone in the colonies united against British rule. If it came to war, the conflict between patriots and Tories would rip Prudence's family apart. Heading north to visit her mother, Prudence wondered how far her Tory brothers would go in this fight. Would she be forced to choose between family and freedom? As she chatted with her mother, Prudence heard voices in the next room. Peering around the corner, she spied an old schoolmate, Leonard Whiting, and her brother Samuel. She caught a word here and there, messages, troops, the British, Boston, Samuel, her favorite brother, a spy? Prudence slipped out and hurried home. Days later, as Prudence's family slept, horsemen raced from Boston to Lexington to Concord. Horse hooves pounded throughout the moonlit night across the countryside, raising the alarm. By morning, a rider reached Pepperell to warn of advancing British troops. The regulators are coming or the regulars, excuse me. David ran from the field, grabbed his coat and musket and rushed to the alarm post. The commander issued orders and Pepperell's Minutemen marched off to battle. Prudence held her five children close, wondering if she'd ever see her husband again. Then she grabbed the plow and picked up where David left off. The women of Pepperell became farmers, blacksmiths, merchants, and millers. The next day, couriers brought news of patriots pushing the Redcoats back to Boston. Then came reports of dead and wounded. Soon rumors raced across the countryside. The Redcoats are coming, invading towns, ransacking homes, burning shops, Tory spies. Some people fled, but Prudence remained. She knew no one was watching the bridge in Pepperell a main route for the British between Canada and Boston. She knew spies and messengers could pass unnoticed. And she knew if British troops came through, the Minutemen would be trapped. Prudence ran from neighbor to neighbor. Within minutes, women emerged from their homes, dressed in the clothes of their husbands, fathers, brothers, and sons. More and more joined as they flowed down the streets, carrying old muskets, pitchforks, axes, shovels, whatever they could find. The women weren't organized and trained like men, but they were bound together like blocks of a quilt. The first ever unit of minute women assembled at the bridge and elected Prudence as their leader. So there she is standing tall. I love the way that they combine that image of a quilt um, locked together in little patches with the minute women. I think that's pretty cool. So there she is, Captain Prudence. Captain Prudence surveyed the road winding around the hill. British troops or messengers would come from the north. The bridge would remain unseen until the last minute. Prudence shielded her lantern, and the women settled into their shadows to wait. As darkness deepened, so did their worry. How many would they face? How long could they hide their identity? What if they were captured? Or worse. Horses from the north. 
Prudence issued orders and hushed the woman. She listened. How many? One, two? Prudence peered into the night. Nearing the bridge, the hoofbeat slowed, then started across the wooden planks. Half, halt. The minute women leapt out from their shadows as Prudence's voice cut through the darkness. The second horseman spun around, but Prudence caught a glimpse. Her brother Samuel raced away. The women surrounded, remain, surrounded the remaining rider and seized the reins. Just as Prudence had suspected, Captain Leonard Whiting, a loyal to the king, Whiting studied the faces behind the pitchforks and axes. Women? They snatched his gun. His eyes widened. Prudence? Not the schoolgirl he remembered, but the same independent spirit. She ordered him to dismount and began to search him. Hat, coat, boots? Aha! She reached into the boot, pulled out a wad of papers, and unfolded them. Dispatches for British troops. They had caught their spy. The women bound their prisoner, marched him into a nearby tavern, and guarded him overnight. In the morning, they delivered Whiting and the papers to Patriot authorities. When the men returned home with tales of their battles, the women listened. Then wives, mothers, sisters, and daughters shared their story of Captain Prudence Wright, the Minute Women of Pepperell, and the capture of a Tory spy. Prudence passed down many treasures to the generations that followed. Her paper love box, her quilts, the lantern she carried that night. But the greatest of all is her story, a bridge connecting us to the past, and the dawn of a revolution. When Prudence coming right and the minute women of Pepperell marched from their homes and took up arms against the British, they did much more than declare independence from the king's rule. They broke free from traditional female rules, never surrendered to fear and proved themselves as full citizens. Revolutionary women indeed. So that's the story of Prudence Wright. What did you think? You can tell me in the chat. Let's see. I've got another poll for you. This is my Rebel Girls poll. So which of these revolutionary her heroes have you heard of? George Washington, Paul Revere, Sybil Ludington, Deborah Sampson, and we just heard about Prudence Wright, but had you heard of her before maybe? Or you can say, yeah, I just heard about her from you. And I'll give you another second to finish up. And one thing I love about the story, I was reading about the research that the author did. And one thing that she learned was there were, um, people of African descent that lived free in Pepperell. And so when you look through the illustrations of the book, you see that there are people with different colored skin. Um, and she did a lot of research into the story too, because there's not so much um, history written down by women. Um, sometimes it's history that is passed down by those revolutionary women. Um, by storytelling or um, sharing from one person to another. So um, she was really challenged as to how to tell the story. Um, and uh, it was interesting to see how she and the illustrator worked together to do that. So I'm going to end my poll and share the results. So I have a few ladies up here, um, Prudence Wright, Deborah Sanson, Sybil Lundingard, Lundington, I just want to call her a different name. And then I have Paul Revere and George Washington, and it looks like most of you have heard of them, right? So I'm going to stop my share, and we're going to do an activity now. Um, I have some other revolutionary ladies. I want to share some info with you about them. 
And what I'm going to have you do, I have it as a poll, and we did this before if you were with us last time, um, but I don't think, I think we could see each other that time. So um, we've done some scavenger hunts where we could, we could see each other and interact, and those were kind of fun because we could see each other running around, but this time we're going to use polls just so we can share this further out um, and respect your privacy. Um, so... I want to talk about revolutionary women, and I'm going to give you a little poll scavenger hunt at the end of telling you about each of these ladies. Um, and as we talk about these ladies, I'll give you a prompt to find something. And you can run into the next room and find it, or you can um, just follow along in the poll and say, yeah, here's what I would find. Here's what I think is associated with that lady. So some of the things I say are going to be things that probably weren't associated with her, like Pokemon cards, right? Or um, cell phones, but there were lots of things that kind of can represent that lady. So up here is a woodcut, a really cool illustration. And we're gonna tell you a little bit about the Daughters of Liberty. So 2.5 million people lived in the 13 colonies and half of them were women but not much is known about them um, because those women weren't always wealthy or famous. Some of them uh, became well-known, obviously. Um, Martha Washington was pretty famous, Abigail Adams, but there were other women out there and they didn't have educational opportunities that um, women like Abigail Adams might have. So um, that didn't keep them from being politically active. And we saw that partly in the book, right? Um, they shopped for British products, right? They had to buy things for their families and many of them decided to boycott. Um, so they wouldn't buy products like cloth and tea that were imported by the British. And in 1768, the Daughters of Liberty started making their own homespun cloth. So for you, and I'm gonna pull it up here, is can you find this thing in your house which is best associated with the Daughters of Liberty? And there are a few things on here. You can choose whichever you want, whichever one you found or which one you think would be most associated. And there are a few on here that could be. So I've got a tea bag, a tea towel, some fabric or cloth, and a Pokemon card. Um, let's see, and I got my Pokemon cards here, right? So, uh, that works. So Pokemon cards, that's the answer, right? No, nobody chose that. Okay, so maybe you found something in your house. Like I found my Pokemon cards, right? Um, I'm going to share my results. Nobody chose Pokemon cards. Good job. Um, some of you said a tea bag. And I've got some tea here, right? Um, and a tea bag. So um, this is loose tea and it's called British breakfast tea. So they, that um, probably represents them because they made their own tea, right? Or a tea towel. So they spun their own cloth. Here's my tea towel um, or fabric or cloth. And of course, no Pokemon card, right? They weren't around then, silly Miss Allison. So that's my first one. Then we're getting on to our first ladies. So future first lady Abigail Adams is best known for exchanging letters with her husband as he worked to establish new government. So he was traveling a lot and the way that they kept in touch was through letters. And she had one very famous letter because she said, remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not push such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands, she said. And her husband really didn't listen to her uh, very well when he was creating those documents because they don't really consider women, right? They say all men are created equal. So we want to honor Abigail Adams for being an early proponent for women's rights. And I want to ask you, which of these items can you find around the house that best reflects Abigail Adams? 
an envelope, a pen, a stamp, or a smartphone. Smartphone, right? That's a good one. That's the answer. Smartphone. So if you're feeling like getting some exercise, you want to get up and run around, you can. Or if you just want to answer a poll, that's fine. And you can always tell me in the chat what you found too. Like, did you find a postage stamp in your house? And who's on the postage stamp? Because if you're like Miss Allison, you love to collect stamps and never remember to use them. So I'm going to finish up my poll. Here it is. And I'm going to share the results. So did you find an envelope? I'm sure I have an envelope here on my desk. Um, did you find a pen? I've got this really cool whistle pen that says whistle while you work. I'm sure Abigail Adams used something like this, right? Or a stamp. Um, I've got a sheet of really cool stamps that honor Edmonia Lewis here. And obviously she wouldn't have had access to a smartphone. She wouldn't have been able to um, text her husband, John Adams, all of that stuff. She would have to write him a letter. So that is Abigail Adams. And I can't talk about women and the Revolutionary War without talking about our OG here at National First Ladies Library, Martha Washington. So here she is up on the screen. This is a painting that uh, hangs at the White House, but she's actually in clothing um, that wouldn't have been from her time period. She's in Victorian clothing here. Um, it's the time period from when the picture was painted. But um, this is a really great painting and it's witnessed a lot of history. Future First Lady Martha Washington managed servants, ordered supplies and organized meals at her husband's Valley Forge headquarters during the Revolutionary War. She and other officers' wives helped boost morale during the dark winter. And I am going to put up another poll here. So which of these items can you find around the house that best represents Martha Washington? And you might say, Miss Allison, you chose things that represent her husband. And sometimes that happens um, because Martha Washington isn't really on any of our coins, right? Um, and we're just starting to put ladies on coins and bills. So a $1 bill with her husband's image, a coin with her husband's image, a coin with her image or a Chuck E. Cheese token. Which did you choose? And I guess no one's silly out here and wants to choose the Chuck E. Cheese token. Um, but you might be running around the house to find some change. I'm going to stop and share my results. Here I have a dollar bill, right? Um, someone found maybe a coin, a quarter. Nobody found the Chuck E. Cheese, right? And there's no image of Martha on a coin right now. Um, so I'm going to stop my share. That's Martha. So our next lady is Deborah Sampson. Deborah became a war hero. Give me one second so I can see her face. When she disguised herself as a man to serve in the Continental Army, she fought several battles before she was wounded and her identity was revealed. She was the first woman to receive a military pension. She was also the first woman to travel the country on a speaking tour. So let's find Deborah. I'm going to share my poll. And if you're ready to race around the house, which of these items can you find around the house that you think best represents Deborah Sampson? A mask or disguise, a coin, a travel bag or backpack, a baseball cap, or a video game? What did you choose? I'm gonna give you a second to run around and see what you can find. And if you wanna share in the chat what you found, or if there's something else you think that applies or why you think the thing you grabbed applies to Deborah, that's fine. You can do that. I would love to hear what you have to say. So let's see. I'll give me one more second. I'm going to end my poll. 
and share the results with you. So obviously Deborah um, was, was masking who she was. So if you chose a mask or disguise like my mask here, that's totally cool. She was the first woman to receive a pension. Um, so if you chose a coin, that's perfectly right. Because a pension is after you serve in the military, you receive some money after, um, you do that service and then travel bag or backpack. She traveled across the country. Um, you could choose a baseball cap if you were in disguise that way. Um, and video game probably doesn't work. Um, oh, Cynthia, good call. Scissors, something to cut your hair short to create that disguise. Or you could do your baseball cap to put, um, put up your hair if you have long hair and you're trying to disguise yourself. So our next gal is Phyllis Wheatley. She was the first woman of African descent to publish a book she actually published a book of poetry. She used her pen to teach colonists that enslaved people had minds and souls and deserve liberty. During the siege of Boston in 1775, she wrote a poem to George Washington and she was invited to visit with him. So I wanna share a bit of a poem. I'm gonna share my poll. Um, so let's see if you are running around, which of these items can you find around your house that you feel best represents Phyllis Wheatley, a poetry book, a comic book, a piece of paper or a pen. So Phyllis was brought to the U S uh, to the colonies as um, a slave, as a child. And she was purchased by a family who um, taught her how to read. Um, and um, during the revolution, she believed that the Revolutionary War might help um, if if the, the colonists won the war, they might free the enslaved people. Um, she published a book of poems in 1773, um, and she often spoke about freedom. Um, I'm going to read you an excerpt. That means a little piece of the poem, and some of it won't totally make sense because some of it's written in the voice of someone a long time ago, but I think it's really cool and interesting. Um, and you'll definitely understand what she is talking about because she's someone who's talking about freedom, but she doesn't have rights. She's not free. Should you, my Lord, while you peruse my song, wonder from whence my love of freedom sprung, whence flow these wishes for the common good by feelings, hearts alone best understood. I, young in life by seeming cruel fate, was snatched from Africa, fancy, happy seat. What pangs excruciating must molest? What sorrows labor in my parents' breast? Steeled was that soul and by no misery moved. That from a father seized his babe beloved. Such, such my case. And can I then but pray others may never feel tyrannic sway. So even though she was living as an enslaved woman, she was speaking out against tyranny or um, British rule, against not having rights or liberty because she really understood as a slave what it was like to not have rights or slavery. So when she was enslaved, when she published the book, she traveled overseas to England um, and people in England really advocated for her to um, be free. And um, she eventually was given her freedom by her owners. Um, but I think she's a really interesting historic figure to learn about, right? And to celebrate uh, during July 4th. So a few of you connected to a poetry book. If you have a poetry book in your house, you can tell me what 
your favorite poetry book is or what you have. Um, some of you might have had a pen or a pencil. If you aren't a big poetry book collector like me, um, and obviously a comic book this time wouldn't fit, um, but everything else does. So I'm going to stop sharing. And I think I have one or two more people. Oh, Patience Wright. And she is not related as far as I know to Prudence, but here she is on the screen. I love her because she was a sculptor. And not only was she a sculptor, but she was a spy. How cool is that? What an amazing story. So she is considered America's first professional sculptor. So can you believe it? So early in our history, our first sculptor was a woman. Patience Wright made her hobby of modeling wax sculptures after her husband passed away. She traveled to England where Ben Franklin introduced her to many important people who she sculpted. Her work required that these people sit and pose. And while they were posing, she would listen and she would get all sorts of information. So she would act as a spy that way. And then she would hand roll little messages um, and put them in the wax sculptures that she sent back to the colonies. So very cool story of a female sculptor spy. <laughs> Love it. Um, and I'm going to put patience right up here launch my little poll. And you can tell me which of these items you find around the house that you feel best represents patients right. A Q-tip, Play-Doh, slime, glitter glue, or googly eyes. If you're a big craft fan, you might have all of these in your house. So give you a second. Or if there's something that you wanna write in the chat, you can. Um, and you might be watching on Facebook Live too. And you can always comment um, on there if you want. I'm checking to see if anybody's commenting on there. Um, so I'm going to end my poll. And I'm going to show you what I chose. It looks like a lot of people have Play Doh around, and you're definitely right with Play Doh, right? or even slime, because it's thick and goopy. She probably wouldn't have had it back then, either of those tools, but you can use them to sculpt. I was thinking about Q-tips because they're used to clean your ears and get wax out of your ears. And she sculpted with wax. So that's kind of a cool connection, right? So there she is, Patience Wright. And our last one is Sybil. Um, and Sybil is kind of like the female Paul Revere. Um, you've heard of Paul Revere, but Sybil Ludington, she was 16 years old and she rode twice as far as Paul Revere, nearly 40 miles on horseback to gather volunteer troops for the Battle of Danbury. Sybil donned a cape to protect herself from the weather. So, I've got my Sybil pole here. And if you want to run around your house, work up a sweat, warning people that the British are coming and grab the thing that you think best represents Sybil, you can do that. I've got raincoat, boots, umbrella, sunglasses, and cape. You might have a superhero cape. You might have a jacket or a raincoat. So I'm gonna end my poll. It probably wasn't a sunny time, right? It was raining. So rain boots or rain coat, um, cape, any of those would work, right? Think about what you would wear if you were getting ready um, to protect yourself from the weather as you rode so many miles. Oh, Janice has some riding boots. Oops, did I share my results? Here they are. Lots of people. Cape. I think you could choose a superhero cape too if you had it, right? Because all of these ladies are really superheroes. They're doing things that are pretty amazing for women of their time period. So I am going to stop my share because that is the end of my presentation for today. But I am going to copy and paste 
the link to our little guide. So if you want to remember these ladies, you can open up the guide. Um, this will connect you to a link that will pull up our little fun with Flotus guide. Um, there are activities on the guide here. I will share my screen if I can again so you can see it. We'll also send it back out. It sounds like the link's not sharing, of course, but I will um, share the link via Eventbrite to people who are registered and we'll also put it on our screen, hopefully, um, our Facebook page and anything we share. It doesn't like me very much today as far as sharing the link. Um, but here it is. So you can see that Nancy Reagan image that we were sharing. So there are two activities you can do. You can create fireworks in a jar or uh, your own American flag using water science. We were also talking about Prudence Wright. If you are really good at folding paper, and I am not, um, you can create your own Prudence inspired love box puzzle. Um, and we might do something like this closer to Valentine's Day too, because I really like this. Um, there are directions on how to do that and some more information about the ladies that we just learned about. So I'm gonna stop my share there and I'm going to thank you so much for participating in today's program. We love to share information about the first ladies. We love to share information about women in history that might've been overlooked. And we encourage you to connect with us, um, whether you're a caregiver or a grandparent or whoever you are via um, social media or our Eventbrite page. So you can sign up for further events and activities that we host um, virtually um, through the National First Ladies Library. And we welcome you to visit us in Camden at the National First Ladies Historic Site and experience some of our really cool exhibitions. And with that, I want to wish you a happy and safe Independence Day. Thank you so much for participating and we'll see you next time.